Okay, Shavua Tov to everyone. Um, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yom Adaf Ayin Zayin. Um, just to remind everyone, we're having a Siyum Be'ezrat Hashem in two weeks in English on Sunday, July 11th. Everyone's invited on Zoom. Um, there'll be a great program with Tanya White and Shuli Mishkin and some of our community learners. And in addition, we're having in Israel places around the country in 13 locations. There'll be Siyumim. Hopefully you can find one to join that's nearby. Um, all the details are on our website. Um, and also you can register there. Um, and in addition, uh, there's a bunch of, if you're part of a Hadron WhatsApp group, community group, so around the world, there's different groups that are getting together to do the Siyum on their own. Um, so if you're not part of a community group, go on to our site. There's a place for communities. Register, be part of a, a WhatsApp group, and then you can be get updates on whether or not there's a Siyum going on in where you where you live. So as we always say, Siyum are good opportunities to celebrate, to mark your accomplishments, and to meet other women that are also doing the DAF and connect with other people, and it's always a great opportunity. So I invite you to find a Siyum to join if you can. Um, okay, with that, we will get started on our daf. I want to point out one thing I read over Shabbat, which is in Mishnah Eretz Israel that I always refer back to, this book that's written by Safrai, an academic book. Um, he talks about something very interesting about this idea. We, we saw this source about Yechol Yeshev Bachamau B'tzina Kadesh Yitzir. You might have thought that on Yom Kippur, in order to be afflicted, what do you need to do? Oh, thank you for the dedications. I forgot. Let me start for a minute. Before I go back to that, okay, dedications for today. Today's app is sponsored by Elisheva Gray in loving memory of her dear husband, Ron Zafonoda Bahan, his 10th year at site. Grateful for the 25 years we had together, we never took one moment of it for granted and created so many wonderful memories together. Ron was truly a mensch, a gentleman, a wonderful cook, and a sage in his own right. I miss him every day, and I know he would be studying the daf right along with me. And by Shelley and Jerry Gornish, in memory of our O's, I am Zion. Our beloved and greatly missed grandson, Oz Wilczyk, whose fifth year at site was recently commemorated. So one of the things that Safrai talks about is this idea of you might have thought, what's this question? This question sounds like a typical Gemara question. Oh, some silly, almost, you know, not silly, but kind of out there idea, I would say, about maybe one should sit out in the sun and, and tor torture oneself. But what he, he claims here, based on, he says, Orbach, who's a, one of the known big Talmudic scholars, that he said that there were groups of people that believed that this was, right, part of Judaism is to suffer, right? It's interesting, we're talking about this fast day today, right? Why do we have these fasts during the year? And like the idea is, yes, you should have, you should afflict yourself in all sorts of ways as part of religion, that religion is all about this. And that what our Gemara is trying to say is, no, that's not what we believe in. We don't believe in that approach. In other words, that when they questioned, they raised that as a question, it was because there were people who believed that. He says it was a fringe group. It wasn't the majority, but there were people who believed it. He then quotes someone else um, who basically claims that it actually was more, it was, there, it was not just a small fringe group, but there were a lot of people who believed that this is what Judaism was all about. And again, the Gemara is trying to go against that. So the question is, was it trying to go against something that was fringe or something that was actually really part of the culture. And the Gemara is trying to say, no, that's not. That's not what we do. Okay, we're not into all that, you know, torture of the body, torture in all sorts of ways. We, yes, it says, Tanu and Afshot but we limit it to a few things. And we also limit how many fast days there were. Right? We talked about Megillah Ta'ani, which were all these days that they had fasts instituted in different days, right? There were some days that were happy days. There were some days that were sad days. There were many more fasts, right? You think, oh, there's a lot of fast days in the year, but really there were many more. And that got changed over time because it was kind of against this approach that this is what we need to be. So I thought that was an interesting point to bring up. Okay. Now we're on a bit of a tangent. I have to correct one thing I said the other day, which is when we read that when I read the story with Danielle, we were trying to figure out we're in the middle right now um, of this. Uh, we want to now go through the five inuyim. We proved how do we know that achilan shdia is inoy, right? To not eat, not drink. Now then we went to sicha. And then we proved it from Daniel, the Sach Suchlo Sachti. Then we're gonna go to Richitza, which we already got to, and then they say, Oh, well, Sicha is forbidden, and Keshem and Batsmo, right? Mayim Bikirbi, Keshem and Batsmo The water in me is like 
the, the oil, which means rechitza is like sicha, to which the Gemara said, no, maybe that means drinking and not putting on your body. So then they suggested you could actually learn it from suchlo sachti. To anoint yourself, you could anoint yourself with oil. You could also put water on your body. It's all one and the same. The, and then within that, we quoted, and that was all this verse by Daniel. And now we're going to get off on a total tangent of the story of Daniel. We want to understand three words in the verse that we quoted that we didn't understand. So what happens here? Daniel basically fasts for three weeks. I told you when Koresh goes to stop building the Beit HaMikdash, he stops the building, and Daniel says, I'm going to fast for three weeks. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to suchlo sachti. Okay? Then, what happens? Right? He doesn't not eat anything. He doesn't eat good food. Anyway, then it says that, how do we know this is Enoi? Because, and I said this was God, but it wasn't God. It was my mistake. It was Daniel. Um, Gabriel, sorry. The angel Gabriel says to him, okay, and that was the pasuk we quoted earlier, Vayomer Eli, al tira Daniel. Don't fear Daniel. Ki meneyom arishon asher natate libcha lavin litanot lefanecha lefnei elohecha. From the first day you started to, right, the, to fast, and torch, right, afflict your soul, which means to fast and not to do sicha and all that, which was our proof. Then he says, right, your words were heard, and I was able to come up here before God because of you. We're now going to get off on a long story as to, first of all, what does it mean Gabriel could go to speak to God on account of Daniel? Okay, number one, why, second, why couldn't he speak to God before that? And what did Daniel do that allowed him to come before God. So to understand first how Gabriel was chased out of what we call the pargod, okay? Um, I'll just mention, I have it on, I brought it on the sheet, that in the davening and Yom Kippur, we mentioned Gabriel in our prayers, okay? Gabriel was known to be the angel of justice and of strength. So in the piyut Ela Ezkera, which is when we talk about the seven harugei machut, um, the seven, I'm sorry, the 10 harugei machut, the 10 martyrs, it says there in the, the Tet, right, it goes alphabetically, So Rabbi Yishmael is about to get killed. He gets up, right, so he's killed. He gets up to heaven and he asks, The person who's Lavush Abadim is Gavriel, okay? By the way, it reminds us of the Kohen Gadol, Lavush Abadim, wearing the Bad, right? That's what they call the Kohen Gadol's clothing. He says, I heard from Achorea Pargod. I heard from outside the Pargod because he wasn't able to be there in the Pargod. That's the place where God speaks with the angels and, you know, in the literature. He says, I, I heard that Bezot Atem Nilkadim, that basically you're going to be punished for this sin. Anyway, that's a reference to Gabriel and it's maybe a bit of a reference to this story. So now it says, "My va'ani bati b'tvarecha." So we're about five lines from the bottom of Ayin Vav Malbim Bet. Haynu dichti. This is what it says: "V'shivim ish mizikne Beit Yisrael." We're now in Sefer Yecheskel. Yecheskel was um, was oh, one second. He wasn't killed. You're saying Gita, but it says he alala marom. He went up to the heavens. I think as part of it must have been when he died. He went up to the heavens. No, it's not. No, okay, wasn't when he died. Okay, he went up to find out, is this, it's in the part where it says he went up to find out, is this really true, and were we really, right, when they're given three days, right, to find, they say you're guilty because of what happened with Yosef, and then he goes up to ask, are we really guilty? Okay, fine, so thanks for the correction. So now what happens? We're now in Yechezka. We're going to see a lot of Sukkim from Yechezka today. The first section is going to quote a little out of order and jump in from place to place. And it's not clear that all these psukim, certainly in the Pshat, aren't all connected. I'll just tell you that. Some are from chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Yechezka. Okay, but what happens? He sees this vision. Now, the, the temple is destroyed, but he sees a vision of Jerusalem with the temple still intact. So Shivim Ish, I see 70 people of the Skinim, right? We always talk about the Shivim Skinim, 70 Skinim, Yoznia ben Shafan is with them. Omdim Lutehem, they're all standing there. Ish Maktar Tobi Yado, Vaatar Ananak Toret Ole. Each person has, this is like where they would put the incense, the Mikteret. And then they each had uh, an Ananak Toret. There's clearly this connection between Yom Kippur and the Ktoret, the incense going up. You'll see a bunch of different connections. Okay, then he sends this, this tablet type thing, grabs me with my curls, 
Tisauti ben Tisauti ruach a wind comes and takes me ben aaretz u ben hashemayim between the heavens and the earth. Vatavei oti Yerushalayim and he brings me to Jerusalem b'marot Elohim a petach shara pnimit haponet zafona and he brings me to the inner gate that's turned that's facing uh, north. Asher sham mushav semel hakinah makna, and there there is the symbol of jealousy. Okay, which basically means there's a vote zara there, right? It's the the anti right against God, it's the thing that that was going to cause God to be jealous. Vayaveo tiel chaser beit Hashem apnimi. So the first thing he sees is a pestle, right? A, a an idol. Then I get brought into this chaser beit Hashem apnimi, into the inner. Courtyard, right? There's the entrance into the hechal between the ulam and the mizbeach. Remember that area just before you enter in to the ulam to get into the hechal, the sanctuary. There's 25 people there. This is, by the way, if you remember, they put up the seir lashem and seir lazalzel there, right? And then they're facing this way with their faces that way. And here you see, instead of that, what, what's standing there? So there's 25 people. Their backs are to the sanctuary, which is really the reverse of the way they should be. And their faces are facing east. And they're bowing east, right? The wrong way. So first they say, wait a minute. It says in the Pasuk, they're facing what? East. Of course their backs are to the sanctuary. So why do you need to tell us this? They revealed their their backs, right? They took off their clothes, and and they would defecate right there. Okay, and that's what it means. Right? They were doing something absolutely disgusting, demeaning in the temple. Michael, Sarchao Matcha. Now, Michael was known as right. We were talking before about Gabriel, who was the, the angel of justice and and of strength. Now we're moving to Michael. Michael is the angel of the Jews. God says to him, Sarchao Matcha, your nation has left me. Right? They've done bad things. Amar lefana v'ribono shel olam. Dai latovim shabahem. So he says to him, and we're going to see this theme come up again. He says, Dai latovim shabahem. Uh, aren't there good people? It sounds like Avraham, right? When he says in stone. God wants to destroy his town. He says, but aren't there tzaddikim there? Why, why, why won't you save them on account of the good people? Amar lo, so God says, Ani soref otam vila tovim shabahem. They're all getting destroyed. Even the good ones, I guess, didn't succeed in helping the bad ones re- repent, and I'm destroying everyone. Miyad, now what happens next? Okay, here, now we're quoting a verse from Yechezkel again. Okay, we're in chapter 8 of Yechezkel. Vayomer leish lavush habadim, this is Gavriel. Vayomer bo el binot la galgal el tachat la kruv. Go between the 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 wheel that's under the kruv. Umale chof necha gachale esh mi binot la kruvim. Okay, male chofen really sounds like the kohen gadol. Remember the handful. Take a handful, but not of the handful. There is the incense. Here, take a handful of the coals that are in between the kruvim. Okay, the cherubs. Take a handful of the coals. Uzrok ala ir. Right, instead of Normally, the Kohen Gadol brings the coals and the incense into the into the Kodesh Kodeshim. He's supposed to take them out. Okay, this is a, a bad sign. Okay, take them out and throw them on the city. And, right, it will come to be seen by me, I guess it means. I'm not sure of that part. Now, miyad, immediately. Now, what's supposed to happen? Gabriel is supposed to take the coals directly. But instead, the kruv, one of the sheriffs, takes his hand. Okay, right. It's obviously this is all an image. It's all a dream. He takes his hands mi la kruvim for between the kruvim ela esh asher beinot kruvim to the fire that's there, the coals. By yisavi yiten al chofnei al chofnei levush habadim by yikach v'yetze. He then goes and he takes it from right. He puts it into the hands of Gabriel, and Gabriel takes it and he goes out and with this he destroys the nation. Am Rav Chana Bar Bizna Am Rav Shimon Chasida. If they hadn't seen the coals from the hands of the crew, right, going to Gabriel, that if this hadn't happened, that's what happens. This is like we learned in Masechet Shabbat, Kli Rishon, Kli Sheini, right? The closer it is to the fire, the hotter it is. As soon as you transfer it, it loses some of its heat. So because they took these coals 
and the Kruvim took them instead of Gabriel taking them directly. And then he got it from the hands on the way, it cooled down. Since it cooled down, right, I didn't need to prove this to you from Masechah Shabbat. This is just, right, normal laws of science. So, they're already cooled off. Since Gabriel destroyed the people with this, there were people saved. It wasn't as strong. But had he done it the way he was supposed to, they would have been entirely wiped out. Which we're going to see. You think that's a good thing, because now they weren't all wiped out. But it's really not a good thing, because that's not what he was commanded to do. Now, Uktiv. Now we're going to chapter 9 of Yechezkel, which actually this is not the context, but it's going to mention again Lavush Abadim, and we're going to see something that happens here. So now what happens? V'uchtiv v'hinei ha'ish Lavush Abadim, asher ha'keset biyado, okay, he has this tab, uh, keset b'motnav, he has this tablet in his, in his loins. I don't know why they mention that, what the significance of that is, but it says, Meshiv davar lemol, asiti ka'asher tzivitani, he goes back to God and he says, I did exactly what you commanded. Now, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, what's the problem? He didn't really do exactly as God commanded, right? He did it differently. So now we're going to see. So, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, okay, do you remember what, why we brought this whole thing up? We brought this whole thing up because we want to see, remember, Gabriel says, Anibati bidvarecha. I came back into God's midst because of you. So the question is, when did he leave? So this is going to be it. So you ready? What happens now? They took him out from behind the pargod. He's not allowed to be there anymore. They, they smacked him with a hundred, uh, I'm sorry, with 60 pulsa denura, which is like fiery smacks. Okay, he got smacked. Punished. They said to him, look, Look, either you didn't do what you're supposed to do, and then you didn't do what you're supposed to do. If you did, why don't you do like God said? Right. This again goes back to the Kohen Gadol and all the things he does in the Kodesh Kodesh. He has to do it exactly, exactly as it said. Here, Gabriel was told to take it from the Ben Akruvim, and he didn't do it that way. Sounds a little like Nadav and Aviyu also. Ve'od, and even if da'avadit, let's even assume. If they're going to have two issues with the fact that he says, I did exactly as you commanded. Number one is, you didn't do exactly as God commanded. Number two, uh, even if you had done exactly, leilach, or there's two ways to read this, but I'll read it one way, is if, even if you did do it exactly as commanded, don't you believe that, don't you know that you're not allowed to come back and report on destruction? Okay, you can report on, I did your, your wishes, but not if it's a destructive act, because we don't want to then blame God for the destruction or something. We, we don't want to, like, God tells you, do it, go do it, but don't come back and say, I did exactly as you wanted. That's one way of reading it. Some people say, al kil kila means, even if you did it, but you didn't do it properly, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to say, I did it, when you didn't do it properly. If you messed up, kil kila means you messed up. Kil kila could be destruction. Or kilkalak can mean you messed up what God said. And if you didn't do it the right way, you're not allowed to report on that. So I chua the dubiel, sorry, the parsai of ugma bucharike. The assumption is that if Gabriel left, someone else took his place. Who took his place? The malach of Paras, the Persians. Okay, because this is a, right, the Persians took over. So the Persian ruler comes in, the Persian uh, angel, and he takes harike is in his place. How do we know this? He was 21 days. He, he was ruling there in place of Gabriel. This is what said. Okay, now we are back in Daniel. Okay, in that chapter in Daniel. And it says that Sarmachu Paras took over, okay, for 21 days. Right, in place of me. That's where they darshan the story from, parts of it. Michael came to help me. And then I was left there with the Machay Paras. So what happened? In other words, I was left with the Machay Paras when the angel of Paras came up, right? So I'm now down on earth. So they gave him, right? This is the angel of Paras. They gave him 21 kings and the city of Mashi. Amal, so he said, okay, if you're going to give me all this, this is what I want. I want the Jews to give me a tax. So they wrote it. I want also the Jews, the, the, not just the Jews, 
Also, the Torah scholars, because there's this thing, the Torah scholars don't have to pay taxes. This comes up in the Gemara in several places. He says, I want even the Torah scholars to give me taxes. Um, it's like a clergy, you know, kind of uh, exemption here. He says, no exemption for them. Ketavule, so they wrote it for him. When they went to sign this decree, right? This sounds a lot like the Purim story, right? It was signed and sealed and all that. So he wants to sign it. In other words, Gabriel comes to, he can't go inside, but he goes nearby and he starts talking and he says, You did this all for no reason. You got up early and you went to sleep late. You you learn all day, all night. You're eating terrible bread. Such he will give for his beloved sleep. Okay. That's very unclear what that means, even to the Gemara. These are the wives of the Torah scholars. These are the women that don't sleep in this world in order to get rewarded in the next world because they wait up for their husbands to come home at night. He basically says, what? Look at all, like, look at your, this is exactly what he did before, where Michael is the one who said, what about the Tovim Shevahem, right? Was it Michael who said it? And he said, what about the good people there? And God said, sorry, right? That was Michael. Here, Gabriel is trying the same thing. He's saying, look, we have Torah scholars. Forget about the Tovim. These are Torah scholars. They're, you know, basically not sleeping because of you. And their wives are, are dedicating their lives to letting their husbands learn. Okay, right. Obviously, we view this in a bit of a different way nowadays, but yes, um, that's, what, that's what it was then. So now he says, um, they ignored him. Now he says, wait a minute, now remember, we're trying to figure out what it means when it says, I got to go back up to heaven because of you, Daniel. And here it comes. So now he says, If you put everybody on one side of the scale and all the wise people of the, of the other nations and you put Daniel on the other side, wouldn't he be heavier than everyone else? Wouldn't he outbalance them, outweigh them? Amar Kadosh Baruchu, Who is that speaking? Amru Lefanav, Ribbono Shalom, Gavriel. He told him it's Gavriel. Amar Lahem Yavo. He says, okay, you can come back now. Okay, basically, Daniel's schut got Gavriel to go back, and that's Shene'emar, Vani Bati B'dvarecha. Okay, I came on account of you. Amar lehu le'ol, so they said, come in, ayeluhu, and they let him in. Ata eshkechei ledubiel, so now let's figure out the end of the story with the Persians. So Dubiel, the Sar of the Persians, by the way, they say his name is Dubiel because the, in Daniel, the dove, the bear, is the sign for the Persian, uh, the, the Persian people. So Dubiel is the Sar of, right, from the word Dubin. Um, so he sees Dubiel, he has the edict in his hand. Ba'ilam Mirma Mine tries to take it away from him so that he can rip it up. Bla'a, so Dubiel swallows it. Okay, now, two versions of what this what happened here. Some people say it was written already, but it wasn't signed. And because it wasn't signed, well, we're going to see the continuation. So it was like half done. Written, but not signed. Some people say it was signed, but when he swallowed it, the, the signatures came off with his saliva. Either which way, it wasn't really signed at this point, even though it was inside his body. No one can see it anyway, but obviously this is symbolic. Hainu, and then what does this come to explain? This is a classic, right? It's coming to explain something that we see happening, which is, Hainu de de paras, ika de yav kaga, ika de lo yav kaga. There's some tamidei chachamim that they force them to pay taxes and some that don't. And if you want to know why some yes and some not, it has to do with this in between stage that happened in Shemayim that it was written, but it wasn't sealed. It wasn't signed or it was signed, but the, the signature is wiped off. This is why they can somewhat have rights to take taxes, but not full rights of the Talmud Yechachamim. That's an interesting aside. Vani Yotze, and then the Psukim continue with, with uh, Gabriel here, Vani Yotze Vine Sar Yavan Ba. This is obviously symbolic, and this is what Daniel is all about. The different kingdoms that are going to rule over us, right? And Gabriel says, and as the Machu Paras, I got rid of him, but then Machu Yavam is coming. And, and then what's his reaction? As avi, avi, ave, ave, I start screaming, but nobody listened to me, you know. And then we know the Greeks come, and obviously, you know, the Jews suffer under the Greeks. Okay, that was all 
a total aside, but as you saw, there were clear connections to Yom Kippur and this vision of Jerusalem and in its destruction. And you could also imagine they're, right, they're relating to the issue of destruction. You see again the Talmudei Chachamim in a different place in society than everyone else. Maybe it's again a way of showing that once the destruction's over, right, the Talmudei Chachamim were the ones at the top there. Um, anyway, all sorts of things one can take from the story, but let's move on. This was all in the context of Rechitza is Inoy, and we learn it from Sukh Losachti of Daniel. We tried to learn it from that Pasuk that connected Mayim Bikirbi to Sukh. In the end, we said, well, you can actually learn it directly from the Pasuk because Sukh is to anoint, it could be also to put not only oils on your body, but also water. Third proof that Rechitza is also suffering, uh, affliction. Vibait Ema Rechitza Dikre Inoy Menalan. Mehacha, you can learn it from here, Dechtif. Okay, this is with Shlomo Amelech. He says to Aviatar, who was a Kohen in the time of David, go, go to Anatot by, with your field, because you're a dead man. But I'm not going to kill you today. Because you did do something that gives you, gives you some reward, which means I won't kill you today, because you carried the Aron Lefne David Avi before my father, David. Bechi, here comes the key word, hit aneta bachol asher hit You afflicted yourself just like David afflicted himself. Now we're going to have to see where did David afflict himself, what would be included here. Uchtiv be David, ki amru ha'am ra'ev va'ayef v'tzamei b'amidbar. They said the nation was thirsty, I'm sorry, was hungry and tired and thirsty in the desert. Now, ta, right, thirsty and hungry, we understand, food. But now, what's this ayef? Ra'ev mi lechem, tzamei mi ma'im, okay, thirsty for, um, hungry for food, for bread, thirsty for water, ayef mi ma'im, what else could it be? Lav mi rechitza, right, you know when you're tired and you haven't taken a shower and then you take a shower and you feel so much better, so must be they were tired from not showering. V'dilma mi lata sandal, they say maybe it means they weren't wearing shoes, in other words, maybe it was the shoe issue and not the, the hunger, uh, not the washing. So they reject that pasuk. They say, maybe it's from here. Mine Karim, and that's not that they reject that pasuk. It's just you can't necessarily prove from there that Ayef, there you can prove Ayef is Enoi. We just don't know what Ayef is. So we're going to find Ayef somewhere else. And we're going to see that Ayef means not washing your body. Mine Karim al Nefesh Ayefa, cold water to a tired soul. So now they say, wait a minute, cold water is washing? Wouldn't you think cold water is drinking? Dilma mishtia doesn't mean cold water for a, for a tired soul is to drink, to bring your soul back. So they say no. Miktiv bin nefesh al nefesh It says on the soul. On the soul sounds like outside. Whereas in the soul would mean inside the body. On the soul sounds like outside, so it must be ayef is washing. And there you see from David, ayef is inoy, because by Eviatar it says, you did inoy affliction like David did, and from there we get that it's washing. Nilata sandal. Again, yeah, it, it seems very clear to me anyway that these five or six, as we count them, inuyim were known, and what they're trying to do is connect them to verses, but not necessarily that you're really deriving it from these verses. Nilata sandal menalam. What about shoes? Now, normally we think of shoes means don't wear leather shoes. We all wear shoes on your kipper. We don't walk around barefoot. But I want to point out that in the Tosefta, it appears that you can't even wear cloth shoes, okay? And that there are opinions, there were opinions in the Tanitic times that no shoes were allowed and you actually really had to walk barefoot. And you're going to see these sources all seem to talk about barefoot. However, there are clear sources that say it only or, I think it's in the Yerushalmi, and from there we get that it's only leather and you can wear other shoes. But just know that there were opinions that say that even, even um, cloth shoes are not permitted. So how do we know Nilata Sandal? David David went up to Malay Azetim. He was crying and he goes up and he cries. The Rosh Lo his head was down, right? This is always a sign of Avelut, of mourning. And Veholech Yachef, and he was walking barefoot. So here you see, barefoot, right? Yachef Mimai, Lami Nilata Sandal. Doesn't Yachef mean, right, without shoes on? To which they say, Vedilma Misusio Mirit Martika. Maybe it means he didn't have horses and whips. As barefoot, you could say barefoot just meant without his stuff, without his, right? He kind of didn't have any weapons with him. El Amar of Nachum Bar Yitzchak Mehacha. So he says, fine, I'll go show you a different passage where it's clear. Lechu pitachta sak me'al matnecha. And then, 
sorry, I just lost my place. V'na'alcha tachlotz me'al raglecha. And take your shoes off your feet. Uchtiv, and then by there it says, Vayaz ken haloch arom v'yachev. He went there naked and barefoot. And there you see, tachlotz na'alcha, take off your shoe, and it was barefoot. Okay? Yachev mimai, lav mi lats v'dal, does it not mean from shoes? So they say, no, you could say, Ema b'menalima metulaim. Yachev just meant he had torn shoes. Okay, shoes that were patched up, that were in good in good shape. How do we know that? Tilote mahachi aroma aroma mash. What you think he went totally naked? What does it mean aroma? Well, meant my right. Um, Right, it must be he was wearing worn-out clothing, torn clothing. That's what it means, naked. It doesn't mean he was really naked. Therefore, it doesn't mean he wasn't wearing shoes at all. It just meant his shoes were torn. So fine, I'll give you a different pasuk. Prevent your feet from being uh, bare and your throat from being thirsty. They're going to explain that verse. Prevent yourself from doing sin so that your feet won't go barefoot. And Rashi explains when you go to Galut, when you go to exile. And Tosfo Yeshanim adds to this that the Hoche Gola, the people who went to Galut, always went barefoot. It was like a known thing that they went barefoot. And therefore, they clearly associate this with being barefoot. So they say, right, prevent yourself from doing sin so your feet won't end up being barefoot. What does that mean? That's a sign for being exiled having no shoes on. So from here you see that Yachef, again this proves Yachef is barefoot, no f- shoes, as opposed to maybe wearing shoes that are just torn. And from there we go back to the beginning where it was called Inoy and it was Yachef. And they're just now explaining the second part, the Pasuk, right, don't say, don't speak unnecessary things, right, or maybe like Lashonara, bad things, so that your throat won't get punished, right, by, and that's if you this is what we call midah kenege midah. If you run to do sin, you'll end up walking barefoot. If you speak bad things, you'll end up not having drink uh, for your throat. Okay, so we've gotten through rechitza, sicha, we got through achila shtia, rechitza, sicha, nila tasanda, we're left with tashmisha mita. Okay, you can't have sexual relations. So, tashmisha mita de ikor ino minal, and we saw this already before, dechtiv im taneb binotai de im tikach nashim. This is what Lavan says to Yaakov. He says to him, when they make this pact at the end, this breach, they say, if right, you have promised me that you won't torture my daughters and imtikach nashim. So it sounds like, number one, don't, prevent, don't stop having sexual relations with them when they want. Number two, don't marry other women. So now the Gemara asks again. right? So first they say, Im mitashmish. that means... Like what I said, don't not have sexual relations with them. Im tikach mitzaro. That means second wives. Right? They already had, remember, pilak shot, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Ve'ema idividi mitzarot. Maybe they both mean second wives. Maybe the idea is don't take any more wives. That will be torturous to my daughters if you take more more wives. So they say, no, miktiv im tikach. And as it doesn't say im ta'ane im tikach. In other words, if you torture them by taking another wife. No. It says, tikach, as if they're two separate things. So it can't be that. So they suggest again. Maybe it means, don't torture them by taking Bilha and Zilpa, who were their, his, their pilag shot, and making them the status of wives. Right In those days, there were wives, and then there were concubines. The concubines were a lower status. Pilagish is concubine. What he's saying is, number one, don't torture them by promoting the, your concubines to wives. Number two, don't take more wives. That's empty kach. But now they say, right, then and what's their proof? Makes sense. Dumia de empty kach. And there's a parallel here. Imtane, empty kach. They're all talking about the same thing. But they say, miktiv empty kach ve imtane, imtane ve empty kach tiv. The order doesn't make sense according to that. One could argue the logic here. But what Rashi explains, the logic is, if you're going to say, don't do this and don't do that, you're going to start with the more harsh. The more harsh is, don't take new wives. To take the concubines and elevate them to the status of wives, that's not as harsh. Worse to take new wives entirely. So, right then, they're already somewhat used to, so it's not as threatening. They were once concubines to begin with. They won't have exactly the same steps. Therefore, it makes sense to start off with the more harsh and then go to the less harsh. One could argue with that logic, 
But that's the proof that they use that it can't be talking about that. Now they say, okay, so basically we have our proof. Im tanep in otai means, right, don't, um, don't, what's the word? I can't think of how I want to say it, but don't, right, don't not give them what, when it's time to have sex with them, they, they are expecting it, right, it's their time of the month, you should do, provide for them. Now, Amalei Rav Papa Labai, Ha tashmish gufei inoi. But wait, we have a verse where having sexual relations could be called inoi. And maybe that's what he means. Okay, don't torture them through sexual relations. Right? We know that can happen. How do we know this? Well, from the Torah. Um, in the story of Shechem, when he rapes Dina, it says he slept with her and tortured her. There you see. Ah, it means the opposite of what you're saying. So Amalei. Hatam she'inami bi'ot achirot. This is a very strange line. Or how to interpret it. Rashi brings two interpretations. He says one interpretation, which is the one he prefers, is that the first time he had sexual relations with her, raped her. Then after that, he did not provide for her when she wanted it. So that is the torture. Okay, the torture is the same as with Lavan, what he said about his daughters. And it means, right, later on. Now, it's hard for us to see this with our modern eye, what she was raped and then she wanted it. But we do see that she also, in the end, wanted to be with Shem. Um, that's number one. Now, then Rashi pr- pr- brings a different one, which was, Shabala shaloke darka. In other words, ina bebi'ot acherot is in other types of sexual actions, not actually having intercourse, but other kinds. Like bia shaloke darka, which often is called, is anal intercourse, is different explanations of what exactly that means, but let's just assume that for right now. So that that he did, in other words, in the end, it wasn't through normal sexual relations, and therefore you don't necessarily have to say that's Enoi. But the first interpretation Rashi thinks is a better interpretation. Also, it fits more in with what the Gemara is trying to say, which is that Enoi is really not providing, as opposed to providing. Tanu Rabbanan. Okay, we're done with that. We've gone to our proof now. In Tanet Benotai stands as the proof for Enoi, is Tashmish Amita is refraining from having sexual relations. Okay, next. Now, from now till the end of the daf, we're going to, with, with again, we're going to get all off on some Nevoah from Yechezkel about something in the future, but mainly the topic is going to be all sorts of exceptions to these rules. Right? We have rules and then we have exceptions to the rules. Tano Rabbanan. So, bright. You can't wash even a small part of your body the way you would wash any part, your whole body. It's not just your whole body is forbidden. You can't even wash a small part of your body. But here's the exception. If you were filthy with, you know, a lot of dirt, with feces or something, you are you can wash normally and you don't have to worry about it. You can't do anoint part of your body like your whole body, meaning any anointing is a problem. But if you were sick, you had scabs on your head. You can do it normally. Another bright, from the house of Menashe. Rashbag says, Normally, we wash our hands in the morning. We do nitilat yadayim. It's to get rid of an evil spirit. Okay, we're going to see it's called shifta in a minute. But right now, the assumption is that you do it before you touch food. That it would basically poison the food if you didn't get rid of it. So if you're going to feed food to your child, you can wash your hand and not worry about it. Okay, but one hand. Wash one hand and touch the water, uh, touch the food, and that way you won't have the evil spirit on it. He didn't even want to wash one hand to do it. And they said to Shammai, you have to. You have to wash both hands. And we want to use you as an example. And you really have to. You can't not feed your children on Yom Kippur because you don't want to wash your hand. Okay? Shammai was known also to believe that even children needed to fast. This seems to say he's not feeding his children because he doesn't want to wash his hands. But in other sources, it appears he didn't. He also believed that any child, any age should be fasting, which is a crazy radical opinion. Um, anyway, people went against him about it. My time. Uh, what's the reason? Okay, in other words, and then people say from here that we actually do wash our hands in the morning on Yom Kippur, right? Just our fingertips because of this shift of this evil spirit that you're not even allowed to touch your eyes or any part of your body without, they believe that there was an evil spirit that came out at night and then you wash your hands in the morning to get rid of it and then you're even allowed to do it. Um, even if you're not serving food to anyone. Tano Rabbanan. Ha'olech lakbil pnei aviv o pnei rabo o pnei mishagadol mimenu. 
if you want to go to your father, your rabbi, or anyone who's greater than you, um, commentaries say greater than you, but chokhmah, right? In, maybe in chokhmah of Torah, or someone you respect, over ad savero b'mayim ve'en ochoshesh. If there's a body of water in between you and the person, you're allowed to go through the water, and you don't have to worry about it until your neck. So now they ask a question. Can a teacher go to visit his student? The reverse. Tashma. Let's learn from here. The Amar of Yitzchak Bar Barchana. Ana Chazite Liza Ere. The Azav Lagabei Rav Chia Bar Ashi Talmide. I says Ere. You went to Chia Bar Ashi as student. So I guess so. Rav Ashi Amal. Rav Ashi says no. Ahu Rav Chia Bar Ashi. Who the Azav Lagabei is the Ere Rabbe? No. It was the opposite. You got the story wrong. It was the teacher, the student who went to the teacher, and you can't learn anything about a student. The teacher can't go visit a student and go through the water. Another heter. Now, he allowed people to go watch their fruits, right? This is a very different image than we have of Yom Kippur. Normally, Yom Kippur, everybody's in shul all day. It seemed people were watching their fruits, even. If they could watch their fields, I guess they had no one else to watch. I guess they couldn't find non Jews to do it, so they would watch their own fields, and he even let them go through the water. In order to do that, so Abai says to Rava, "Tanya de Maseilach, I'll bring you a bright to prove what you just said." The people who watch the the fruits in the fields are allowed to go until their necks in the water, and they don't have to worry about it. The people in Tarbu, he allow people to go to the drasha to go hear the the, the rabbi teaching that day. But he wouldn't let them go home. So, Amalei Abaye, Abaye, student says to him, they won't go next year if you don't let them go home, right? Then you're, they're never going to go. This is the classic question of, you know, if you let the doctors go to the hospital, we allow them to go home because otherwise they won't come next time, right? So, they use this same idea here. Iged Amri, some people say this story was different. It wasn't that Rav Yosef said no, and then Abaye said you should allow them, but it was the opposite. Sharele Lemei Teve Sharele Lemei Rav Yosef allowed them to go and allowed them to come back, to which Abaye questioned him. I understand why that you're allowing them to go to the drasha. Why are you allowing them to go home? To which Rav Yosef answered, okay, So that they won't not go next time. Rav Yehuda, the Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yehuda, have a kaimei aguda dinahar prat. It should be prat, not papa. There's obviously a mistake you'll see because Rami bar papa appears in a second and it got switched by accident. But it should be they were standing on the banks of the river, the Euphrates, a mabara de chatzdad by the ma'avar of the city chatzdad. Vehava kai Rami bar papa mehach gisa. Rami bar papa's on the other side. He starts screaming. Rama lehu kali starts screaming across the other side. Ma'u lemeabe lemeite legabayu lemishal shmata. I have a question to ask you. Can I go across? Okay, you think he, if he's screaming that, he could scream the question, but maybe the question was more complicated. So he screams across, please, you know, can I come across? Amalei Rav Yehuda. Okay, so Rav Yehuda and Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda were there. So according to the first version, Rav Yehuda says, Rav Shmuel, the Amri Travai, you remember Rav Yehuda was always quoting for Rav and Shmuel. Rav and Shmuel both said, Over yado, mitachat chalukot. You can go, but you can't take your hand out from under your cloak. Okay, apparently the cloaks had no, like a poncho, had no sleeves. You can't take your hand out. All different reasons why this is. If you take your hand out, Rashi says you're going to put it on your shoulder, right? It's like your your cloak is going to end up on your shoulder, and you'll end up carrying. Basically, it's like you're carrying it. You can't. If you remember, you can't fold your talis with some mesechet shabbat on over your shoulder. So doing that is like wearing it on your shoulder. Um, some people say it's to prevent swimming. Some people say it looks like you're bathing for pleasure. So don't make it look like that if you pick up your hand. Just keep your hand underneath, and then you won't have an issue. Some people say it's to remind you that it's Yom Kippur and that you can't squeeze out the water when you get out. Okay, all different possibilities. Anyway, according to this, Rav and Shmuel said it. Second version, Ika de Amre, Amrle Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yehuda. It was Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yehuda and not Rav Yehuda himself. It was his son who said it, Tanina, and he didn't quote in the name of Rav and Shmuel. He quoted in the name of a Brayta, which is a stronger source. You can't take your hand out from under the hem. Same thing he says, it's just he quotes it from a Brayta. Now comes our interesting question, which gets us into these verses in Yechezka. Matkev la Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef asked the question. Until now we said you could go up to your neck without a problem, right? On Yom Kippur. Now, this seems to imply you can always go in the water up to your neck. It comes Rav Yosef and he says, mishari, But can you go in the water up to your neck on a regular day? V'aktiv. And now we're going to read this nevuah from Yechezka, which discusses this vision he sees of a person who t- he sees... The, the future Jerusalem, and there's this stream that comes out of the Kodesh Kodeshim. We've seen this reference before. 
And it's going to basically say, this person, this angel is going to take him through Vayamit Elif Ba'amai. He's going to take him through the Nachal. Okay? It says he, he measures a hundred, a thousand cubits. Vayavirenu Ba'amai Me'af Sayim. And he brings him. The water right now is up to his ankles. Mikanchi Mutar Lavor Adaf Sayim. So from here you learn, you can go through the water until your ankles. Vayamit Elif, he measures another thousand. Vayavirenu Ba'amai Me'af Sayim. Up to his knees. Mikanchi Mutar Lavor Adaf Sayim. You see, Cheska's going through this water, so no problem. You can go to your knees. Vayamet elef yevrenu me'matzayim to his loins. Mikan shemut alavor abmatzayim right to his hips. Mikan ve'elach vayamet elef nachal asher lo uchal lavor. He measures another thousand cubits and already it's a nachal that I can't go in anymore. So what do you see here? You can't go in when it's deeper than your hips, which means up to your neck. You can't go in water like that. It's dangerous. So Amar Bai shani nachal to redeem him. A nachal a street. Um, uh, 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 what's a nachal? Uh, a river has a very strong current. That's dangerous. But a stream, which is not really much of a current or, or something, you know, more like a lake, no problem. Maybe you could go by swimming. No, it also says the water was too deep for swimming. Then they say, Why sachu? How do you know sachu is to swim? Now, we know this because we use lishot as the Hebrew word, but it gets, comes from here. Shiyuta. Right? Mesachu is shiyuta. Shekenko in the shayata sayacha. So those are words are interchangeable. Shayat was a word they knew more, which was to swim. Maybe you could go in a small boat. It says, also, these are all the verses from Yechezkel there. You can't take boats there. How about a big one? You can't go through with a big fleet. How do we know that Oni Shayat is small and Siadir is big? Kedem Targum Rav Yosef, as he explained the verses there, the Targum there was Lo Tazal Be Besfinat Sayadim, which is a small boat, or Borni Rabate Lo Kitigozen. You can't go with a big boat. Okay, so there you just see the Targum there explains big and small. Last line for today, Amar Rav Yehuda Ben Pazi Af Malach Hamavet Ein Lo Rushi Lavor B'Tocho. Even the Malach Hamavet can't go in this water. This water is like special magical waters, right? And it's very deep and a very strong current. And even the Malach Hamavet can't go through because it says Ktiv Hacha Bal Telech Bo Oni Ashayid. He darshes this pasuk different. Oni Shayit, he says Shayit is a reference to the, to the Malach HaMavet or to the Satan. How do we know this? Because it says in Eov, that the, the angel, right, the Satan comes back from wandering around, right, floating or swimming in the, in the land. And they say there you learn Shayit there is referring to the Satan, which is like the Malach HaMavet. If the Satan can't go through the Malach HaMavet either, the angel of death can't get through this water either. Tomorrow we're going to talk about this water, where it comes from and where it went to, how it comes out from Kodesh Kodeshim. It's very thin and then it gets much bigger, bigger, bigger until it becomes cement. And that's basically the LF, the keep the LF cubits, the thousand cubits he kept measuring and going out. So we started with Yechezkel, we end with Yechezkel, all sorts of interesting prophecies. Have a good fast, everyone, and uh, we'll meet up tomorrow.